The best-selling smartphones of all time and by a long shot are the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, at around 220 million units sold. And it makes sense, they were the first iPhones to bring the large phablet display that was on the rise in the market for years prior to its release, thanks to phones like the Galaxy S4, which to this day is still the best-selling Android smartphone ever, right around 80 million units, significantly less than the iPhone 6 to be sure, but given how much variety there is on the Android platform, Form, there's no question, it's extremely impressive. But what's interesting is while the S4 is the best-selling Android ever, there are a good few phones above it, and they aren't just iPhones. You have the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus with around 120 million units, the iPhone 5 with around 143, and then above the iPhone 5 is the Nokia 5230. That's right, a non-Android Nokia smartphone. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and today we're talking about an unboxing the Nokia 5230 the second best-selling smartphone of all time with over 150 million units sold. And yet, it runs neither Android nor iOS, but instead Symbian OS, a discontinued mobile operating system that had actually been created in the late 1990s and would hold as high as roughly 70% of the global smartphone market share in 2006. Today, we're going to unbox this brand new, never used Nokia 5230 and see just what this phone and operating system is all about. If you've never heard of the phone or Symbian OS, don't feel too bad. Uh, neither did I. I've definitely heard the name Symbian OS, but I didn't know what it was. I'm going to quickly cover some of the context behind the Nokia, and then we'll get into the unboxing and general overview. So if you'd like to skip ahead, naturally timestamps are in the description below. But before any of that, we do have a quick word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. Do, 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 do. Whoa, Cola, are you watching The Office? Whoa, could it be that you're using a virtual private network to make it look like you're watching from Canada because The Office is no longer on Netflix in the US? Whoa, would you happen to be using NordVPN, the fastest VPN on the market that I've personally been using for years now? Whoa, is it because NordVPN gives you access to over 5,200 servers in 60 countries that are all only a single click away with their easy to use app that's supported on nearly every platform imaginable? Whoa, and with NordVPN, you can ensure that your internet service provider can't see your internet usage and are even unable to throttle download speeds that you're paying for? Whoa, and when you're out using public Wi-Fi networks like at Starbucks, Nord keeps you secure from bad actors who would normally be able to see literally anything you're doing? Whoa, sounds like it would definitely be worth going to nordvpn.com 91tech and using promo code 91tech for a special offer. Plus, they have a 30-day money-back guarantee, which means there's literally no downside or risk. I am in Canada. Whoa, and uh, what? I don't need to use a VPN because we live in Canada, foolish mortal. Even though I'm able to watch The Office on Netflix anyways, I still use NordVPN to keep my private data secure and stay protected around the web. Whoa, that's great. How are you talking? Using NordVPN, I was able to access UK Netflix and watch Richard and Mortimer, raising my intelligence quotient to dangerously high levels and giving me the ability of speech. Whoa, what can't NordVPN do? Save you from an early grave. Whoa, what? I said make sure you use the top link in the description to go check out nordvpn.com slash 91tech to get the best and fastest VPN on the market. Please click that link and give it a look. Josh hasn't fed me in a week because he keeps spending his money on crappy no Kia phones. Whoa, hold on there, you're not supposed Thanks to- Thanks to NordVPN for making this video possible, and now back to your regularly scheduled content. Hope you enjoyed that ad there. Big thanks to NordVPN for making this video possible. It really is a huge help to the channel. And thank you for sticking around. So let's go ahead and establish the background of Symbian OS and the Nokia 5230. Symbian OS was something that started back in the late 1990s and specifically was made for personal digital assistants or PDAs, a niche market that died off as quickly as it arose. For example, perhaps the most notable entry from the era was from Apple with the 1993 Newton, kind of a precursor to the modern tablet today although note that it wasn't running Symbian OS. And in actuality, no PDA ran Symbian OS. But this is because Symbian OS was derived from Epoch 32, which was a follow-up to Epoch 16. I'll keep this fairly brief because it's not super important to the Nokia, but Epoch 16 released in 1989 was a 16-bit operating system and ran on a number of devices. Epoch 32 came out in 1997, and as the name would imply, it was 32-bit. Skip to 99 with Epoch Release 5, 
5, and there were a number of features that ought to sound quite familiar. Things like email, messaging, data synchronization, support for Java development. And then in November 2000, we saw the Ericsson R380, which was a smartphone running Epoch 32 5.1. And yeah, a smartphone released in the year 2000. With Epoch 32 release 6, the whole OS was rebranded to Symbian OS. Scion Software, who had been developing Epoch, became Symbian LTD. PDAs never really died off so much as they simply combined with smartphones by the mid-2000s, as it was the rational and natural evolution, and eventually, as we all know, the market for pretty much anything except for Android or iOS would completely die off by the early 2010s. Symbian OS, at its peak, would be one of the most popular smartphone operating systems, thanks in particular to their close ties with Nokia, even being acquired by Nokia in June 2008. It's easy to forget just how big Nokia was in the first two decades of cell phones. If you look at a list of the best-selling mobile phones of all time, including non-smartphones, it's just a who's who of classic Nokias from the early 2000s. It's no coincidence that Symbian found its peak market share in 2006, the year before a certain smartphone came in and completely changed the marketplace forever. Their day's number, Nokia made the decision to make Symbian OS open source in 2008. Along with this, we would get a revitalized version of the OS designed for the new touchscreen era, one that was tooled not by a stylus, but by your own fingertip. Even with these late changes, it wouldn't take long for the OS to die out. It was just too far behind Android and iOS, and even with an influx of cool features, Android kind of already did everything Symbian did, and did it better. It's quite weird looking at this, because it really looks like Android on the surface. But nevertheless, by 2011, Nokia would partner with Microsoft to integrate their phones with Windows Mobile, and by 2014, they terminated their development and maintenance for Symbian OS altogether. Despite the fairly quick demise of Nokia entering the new age of smartphones, they did have a number of big hits early on, and this here, 5230, was easily the most successful of all of them. This phone had particular success in developing countries, as it really was a budget phone. It was entry level, but had a lot of the necessary quality of life features hitting smartphones at the time, such as 3G networking, Bluetooth, GPS, and support for micro SD cards, along with a fully capable internet browser. However, it did lack something kind of important, Wi-Fi. While this wouldn't end up hurting it in sales, clearly, there was never going to be much success without this feature in places where the internet was getting more and more prevalent, aka the Western market, which leads into why you've probably never heard of it. All right, that's probably enough background for now. Let's go ahead and open the box and see just what exactly this Nokia is all about. Well, I call it a box. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's really the best phrasing. What we have here is a brand new and sealed Mobilicity Nokia 5230. You can see this is actually from Canada, as it says mobilicity.ca. That was lucky for me. I was able to get it off of eBay and didn't have to pay an arm and a leg for shipping. It includes three months of unlimited features such as local talk and text, province-wide long distance, and voicemail and caller ID. What a deal. It also has a free Nokia Bluetooth headset inside, which is a $30 value. Clearly, I didn't pay enough for this, if anything. How much did I pay? Uh, $100. So, honestly, not bad. But anyways, the box or packaging, whatever you want to call it, is not too interesting. You can see it's from 2011 with this copyright on the back. So this was a couple of years after it would have originally come out. I had never actually heard of Mobilicity, and that's because it doesn't exist anymore. It went defunct in 2016, and it looks like it was an offshoot of Rogers. I hate this kind of packaging, for the record. This plastic is awful, but it took some scissors. Eventually, I was able to cut around the actual phone itself and lift it up. This gets us to the little box portion of things. It's not actually much of a box. It's just some cardboard, and there are some accessories and stuff in there that we'll look at in a moment. But here is the phone. It's really darn small. It's very light. It's very plastic. It does have kind of that silver frame, but don't be fooled. That's not metal. It is plastic. It's got a very small camera sensor on the back. And looking to the accessories, we actually have a ton of stuff here, like way too much stuff uh, compared to what we get nowadays with phones. Yeah, no, it's it's quite crazy. And I'm, I don't even understand all of it, to be completely honest. Some of it makes sense. Uh, we have this very thick user guide. I'm not sure this was completely necessary, but we have it. We have the $30 Bluetooth headset, which is kind of cool. It's a bit of a throwback to see these old Bluetooth headsets again. You remember all those commercials where people were using Bluetooth and stuff and people thought they were crazy because it looked like they were talking to themselves? Yeah, that's for whatever reason, that's what <laughs> I think of when I see this. You don't really see these anymore. Everyone has AirPods or something like that nowadays. But the fact that this came with the device is kind of neat, especially because Bluetooth would have been a fairly new technology at the time. So being able to use it with your new Nokia 5230 would have been kind of cool. Then we've got the earbuds, which are wrapped up very awkwardly. This is how they came. Uh, so uh, they didn't do a very good job 
packaging this. So you can see they kind of look like Apple's old iPod earbuds before they switched to the ear pods with the iPhone 5. Kind of just a typical cheap pair of earbuds. They do have a clip on there and I'm assuming a microphone. Beyond that, we have the battery because back in these days with cheaper phones and even today with cheaper phones a lot of the time, you would have to open up the phone yourself and actually pop the battery in. So we'll have to do that. And then we have this. I don't know what this, I, I guess it's a guitar pick. That's what it looks like. I'm not sure why on earth they would include this. Something to loop around your wrist so you don't lose it. I don't know. Maybe it's an opening tool to get the device open because you got to kind of pull at it. I'm not exactly sure what this is supposed to be. Uh, but you know what? I actually really appreciate that they just give you so much stuff with this. Like Apple doesn't even give you a charger in the box anymore, right? So this is kind of neat. There's also, of course, the little micro USB thing, which is to plug it into your computer. And then the charger, which plugs directly into the wall. And there's a lot of paperwork here too. It's not just the user guide. There's uh, quite a bit of stuff here. All in all for like a really budget oriented phone. It's pretty impressive how much we got. And so if we go ahead and open up the phone, we can see inside we have this little paper instruction, little guide to show how to put the SIM card in. I go ahead and I pop the battery in and this is what it looks like with that. Pretty darn simple process. If you ever used an old Android phone from back in the day that was plastic, you definitely know how to do that. And yeah, this is the phone. I did need to plug it in to boot it up. Shockingly, a decade later, it didn't have any charge left. I know, but once I did that, it did in fact boot up. We got the Nokia symbol. I actually forgot about this. The first time I booted it up, there was this really weird glitching on the screen. I have no idea what caused this. The LCD doesn't seem to be faulty because I haven't had any issues since. And once it got to the Nokia logo, it was fine. But yeah, worth mentioning, strange. There's this very strange animation of two hands joining together. It's kind of unsettling. I don't like it. I don't know why. It does say Mobilicity there. And even with that, we have to select our current region, despite the fact Mobilicity only operated in Canada. So I don't know why exactly it's making me scroll all the way down to get to Canada. I also accidentally selected one just trying to scroll and then it was giving me some trouble to go back. You get a real appreciation for how good Apple's multi-touch displays were around this point versus some of the competition. It absolutely is functional here, but it is not nearly as good. So finally, I was able to select Canada and then Vancouver as my time zone. And then I was able to get to the home screen. So you can see I actually started all this back in November 2021, so I'm a little late to finish up this video. But yeah, this is the home screen. Right away, the little maps icon on the bottom right, so that is maps. It looks like Safari. I know it's a compass and like a compass is not exactly any kind of unique thing, but it really looks like just a green version of Safari to me. I apologize for a bit of a flicker waviness to the screen. The refresh rate just is, I guess, a little funky for my camera. But regardless, just looking around here at some of the apps, the icons are those classic old 3D looking icons. Very, very typical of the era. It kind of just looks like an off-brand kind of crappy skin of Android. Looking at it besides my iPhone, you can see just how small it is. And the quality of the display is pretty darn bad as well. It gives me a real appreciation of retina nowadays, that's for sure. Just while I'm editing this, I have to mention, you may have noticed the glare coming off the screen. I apologize for that. This screen is just ridiculously reflective, I guess. So my studio lights were blatantly obvious. So that's a bit annoying, but uh, yeah, just older display. Again, it's one of those things you don't really think about, but with a plastic screen like this, terrible, terrible glare. And so yeah, here's here's the phone. It's uh, definitely nothing too crazy. It actually unlocks with this little slider here. Uh, it's out of focus, but if I just do that, that's what unlocks it, kind of. Uh, that's that's what lets you use the touch screen, basically. There we go. It's a very small phone. Uh, it definitely, it feels, it doesn't quite feel like Android so much. It's certainly closer to Android than iPhone, but it does have its own feel to it. It's honestly really cool. I love obscure phones like this. They're always just so fascinating to me, so let's take a closer look. There are some different variations of the Nokia 5230, but I'll be kind of just giving the standard specs for the device. We're looking at a 3.2 inch display with a resolution of 360 by 640, making for a pixel density of 229 pixels per inch. This was decent for 2009, at least on paper. The screen is definitely not high quality, but there's such a generational gap in smartphones before the iPhone 4 and after the iPhone 4 with its retina display that it's hard to judge it too harshly. It's fine. The screen gap is pretty brutal. Definitely worse than like an iPhone 3GS display, but then again, this was probably a lot cheaper. And this phone was already doing some things right that iPhone wasn't doing yet. Like it has a 16 by 9 screen ratio. So regular widescreen.
screen. For the more technical side of things here, we have a 434 megahertz ARM 11 processor along with 128 megabytes of RAM. This device has about 1.87 gigabytes of storage according to my PC when I plug the phone in. That might not sound like a lot, but with the micro SD card slot that supported up to a mind blowing 16 gigabytes, you shouldn't have any trouble fitting all of your absolutely gorgeous photos on your phone. Ah, uh, all those beautiful photos. Possible thanks to the groundbreaking two megapixel rear camera sensor that can film video in up to an astonishing 480p at 30 frames per second. Okay, I jest, this is bad, but uh, it was pretty standard for 2009, especially when it comes to budget smartphones. It could take a picture, and if you were somewhere where you didn't have your digital camera, then, well, you could take a picture. Plus, there was definitely some fun to be had here, especially with the video recording side of things. This looks straight out of the early 2000s, and I'm totally here for it. It's really weird when you film something modern like an iPhone 13 Pro, but if you look at like an old iMac, yeah, that's a little bit better. I was messing around a bit more with the camera settings on the Nokia, and I realized there are actually some presets for different options when it comes to how you can take pictures and even video. The video has a night mode and an indoor lighting mode, and I didn't go too in-depth in actually trying these out just because I've already spent so much time on this video, but I thought it was quite cool. And just for some perspective, this is a Cola with the indoor lighting mode in the video, and I'll also pop up my iPhone 13 Pro with 4K, capturing Cola in pretty much the same lighting in the same area. And I mean, yeah, we've come a long way, but hey, it is two megapixels. And even if the camera wasn't that great, having options, honestly, I can always appreciate that. That being said, you know what the Nokia has that the iPhone doesn't? A dedicated camera button. That's right, check and mate, Apple sheep. Overall though, you weren't buying this phone for the camera, for the processor, really much of anything. You were buying it because it could do 3G networking, it had a touchscreen, it was an attainable smartphone for a lot of people at the time. And Symbian OS here is very interesting, it's strange. Again, it kind of feels like an offshoot of Android, but it isn't, it's completely different. It's got quite a few interesting quirks. For one thing, this little lock switch is driving me crazy. It's not really to do with Symbian OS so much, but if you hit the home button or any of the buttons, the screen does turn on like you should be able to use it, but it still makes you unlock the device with the little slider on the side. I understand why this is the case. It's so you don't pocket dial or something to that extent, but it drives me a little bit crazy because every single time I try using the phone before hitting the slider, just out of habit from every other phone ever. Here's something a little bit weird. On the top left of the screen, there's this little X, and I have no clue why this is here. Because as far as I can tell, it has zero function whatsoever. It's just always there whichever page I'm on, and it doesn't exit the app like you would think. Plus, it's on the actual home screen. I, I really don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, future Josh checking in. Still have no idea what I'm doing, but that little X, after seeing some pictures of the 5230, that's actually just indicating I don't have a SIM card in or have no signal. I didn't actually realize that's how it shows the battery life, by the way. So there would be a little 3G logo, and then it would just show how much signal you have. I have to say this is just horrible UI design. Am I wrong? Just to have it with an X if you have no SIM card? I guess they didn't think anyone would use this without a SIM card, but it doesn't look good for one thing, but it's also just really confusing. Anyone who actually used this OS back in the day is going to be cringing so hard at this video, but I purposely wanted to go into this blind. I think it's a good representation of how foreign a completely different OS is going to be for the majority of us nowadays. Going back to something like this, it's pretty wild. This is completely different than anything I've used before. And so, okay, I'm, I'm in the final stages of editing right now, and I needed like one quick clip of just showing off the little X again. On the camera, when you're looking at the settings, it's even there. Like, it really looks like it should just close the settings page. There's also the back button, but still. But then I realized that that little gray square to the left of the X, that's a button. I had no idea. I had not pressed it until now. It's a capacitive touch button. You press it and this like slider comes out, kind of similar to what a lot of Androids have nowadays actually. And it just has some basic stuff on there like music. And it's just all these little things I'm stumbling upon by accident because it's all so new to me. It's cool. And I also think that I underplayed just how awful this whole touchscreen experience is. It is bad. It's also weird. And I feel like part of that might be because the OS wasn't originally created with touch devices in mind. For example, the touch screen for one thing, it's not super responsive. A lot of the time I tap something and it just doesn't recognize it. You gotta really kind of push a little bit. Maybe not push, but you really gotta be clear with what you're trying to press. We'll come back to this in a moment, but first, if you want another weird quirk, I accidentally stumbled upon a games folder and of course had to check it out. And there was some kind of roller coaster game with 99 tracks or something. So this is me trying it. This is the actual live unedited version of me trying it. And the amount of loading screens is absurd. A 
eventually, and I'm gonna let this play out, I go ahead and select a level once I get to that point. And if you think this is painful, after selecting the level, we then get a loading screen that goes for about five minutes until the phone turns off its display and I give up. So. I'm gonna say that it's uh, it just isn't going to work. <laughs> this is pre-installed on here and it's not working at all. Maybe it needs an update, but I mean, this is fresh out of the box. Not connected to internet, nothing. And the game doesn't work. I don't know if it's too demanding. I've never heard of this game. It could just be broken again, cause no update, but still this is just absurd. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and end this stupid loading screen now. <laughs> and going back to the issue of when it comes to this, maybe not being designed for a touchscreen so much originally, when you tap an app, sometimes it doesn't actually open it right away. It kind of highlights it. And then you can even drag across the applications to like move what's being highlighted, just like you would do if you were using arrow keys on a non-touch screen device. And there's just a lot of little things like this that make the device feel awkward to try to actually use. And the lag doesn't help. This phone isn't horribly laggy, at least all the time, but it's slow enough to feel slow. And that's never a good thing, especially considering this device is brand new out of the packaging and has had had zero chance to get bogged down by updates and a bunch of apps. Even for a budget device, if you first got this, I would be a bit disappointed. But then again, it was never marketed towards someone like me. And yeah, a bunch of apps. There is actually like an app store on here, kind of, the OV store. But the service has no doubt been down for years now. Not that we can actually use the internet. There's no way for me to get online because of the lack of Wi-Fi. Now, yes, I could put my own personal SIM card in here and connect to 3G, but will I? No. <laughs> uh, frankly, I'm just too lazy and this whole video has turned out to be a lot longer and more of an effort than I expected and I think there's a bit of a charm to kind of just using this device in like the absolute raw fashion that you would have gotten it in 2011 and even if I did connect to the internet I'm not actually sure what we'd be able to do maybe the ancient browser mess around with that it would just be slow potentially the maps app which apparently was considered a big feature in the marketing material but overall this is an interesting phone purely because it's sold so well. The phone itself is extremely bland, and that's a bit interesting in and of itself because you never expect that these bland phones are going to sell, but they did in this case. If anything, the Nokia 5230 is proof that even a mediocre device can be a bestseller if it's at the right price. This was never very impressive, and it never needed to be. It served as a good budget option, and it did really, really well outside of the Western market. This is one of the best-selling smartphones of all time, and I had never heard of it. And even now, I still feel like I don't fully understand it, but I do think that I learned a lot today, and hopefully you did too. Apologies if this isn't quite as in-depth as you were hoping for, but again, this video is stretching on, and I think perhaps a video talking purely about Symbian OS might be a better fit when it comes to just going a little bit more in-depth, and I could potentially get another device running Symbian OS, maybe a more modern version as well as an older version. We'll see how this video performs, but I think potentially I'd be interested and looking more at this kind of stuff. It is really fascinating to me as someone who knew pretty much nothing about it going into this. So hopefully I got all my facts right. Definitely correct me in the comments if I got something wrong and I will ignore your comments and go cry in my room. And so with that, I think I'm right about done here. Thank you so much for watching. Did any of you actually ever use this phone back in the day? Have you heard of it? Make sure you let me know in the comments down below. Very curious there. If you found this video interesting, maybe hit that like button and consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me over on social medias at 91 underscore attack if you'd like to for some reason. And we do have a Discord group link as always in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Big thanks again to NordVPN. It really helps out the channel to be able to do those sorts of sponsorships and maybe go check them out. They're a great service. There's a reason a million YouTubers have done sponsorships with them and keeping your privacy and data secure is just, it should be number one priority. So go ahead and check them out. The top link in the description helps me out and hopefully will help you out as well. So thanks again for watching. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.